The uh, diesel theory, so it all. Uh, my name is Scott Siegel. Uh, I own AR Marine Diesel Service, which is a diesel shop about 100 yards that way. Um, I've been in the, the Marine professionally turning wrenches, um, diesel engines, and gasoline engines uh, for over 34 years now. I teach the diesel course for the Annapolis School of Seamanship. That's where this PowerPoint comes from. Uh, so I'm giving you just a little taste of what that course is. I'm giving you about maybe a 45 minute to hour uh, portion of it uh, from the two day class. And there's also a, an advanced two day class. Um, so personally, I work on from little five horsepower engines up to about five, 600 horsepower engines. And also work on uh, diesel uh, generators. I don't work on gasoline engines anymore since the uh, ethanol uh, came into effect in Maryland. After a couple of years of do it, dealing with phase separation, I was like, you know what, someone else can pump all these gas tanks, I'm tired of it. So I only do diesel now. Um, so let's get started. All right, this is Rudolph Diesel. Back in 1893, he got, what's, he got the, uh, the uh, patent for what's known as the compression ignition cycle. And basically what that patent means is that he was able to ignite a fuel with the absence of a spark. And so the way he uh, is able to do that is he takes a bottle of air and he compresses that air rapidly and the temperature of that air gets so hot that when you inject atomized fuel into that hot environment, it <clears throat> auto ignites. And that's what he got the patent for back in 1893. And for just about 100 years, uh, the machine, the theory behind the machine hardly changed. I mean, it got more sophisticated, more fuel efficient, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but for the most part, the technology didn't really change until the EPA started putting their paws into the emissions coming out of the diesel engine. And in the 1990s, in the marine world, is where I first saw the first the computer on a diesel engine. And my first experience with that was on a John Deere engine, and it was a hybrid. So it's electronically governed, but still mechanically fuel injected. And then in the late 90s is when I saw my first fully electronic engine where the injectors were controlled by a computer. And, and it started out at the high horsepower, and it's now trickling down to the lower horsepower. So even on modern sailboats, you cannot get mechanical fuel injected engines, especially if you're going with like a Yamaha. Anything above their 29 horsepower is an electronic engine now. What does it mean for you all? Depends on what kind of boating, where you're doing your boating, how, whether that's going to affect you or not. You know, for the most part, the machine's going to run fine and not give you any problems, but it is an electrical device, a computer that is controlling the engine. If that computer doesn't work, your engine doesn't work. And so if you're cruising up and down the, the ICW and just off the coast of the America, you won't have too much difficulty finding someone to work on it. And if you're two, three hundred miles in the middle of the ocean, you're going to be stuck. Even if you have a spare ECM, it's got to be programmed with a computer. So a computer needs to talk to his computer. And so in the U.S., we'll be able to find people with that computer. But if you're going down into Bahamas and third world countries, the likelihood of being able to find someone who has the computer to talk to your computer to do any diagnostics and repairs is going to be a lot harder to, to deal with. So the modern engines are not the zombie apocalypse engines. All right. So basically, uh, like I said, uh, you take a bottle of air. You compress that air rapidly, and the temperature of that air goes up. It's not that we've added any heat to that air. Each molecule that's in that air has a certain amount of heat to it. And then when you take all those molecules and you compress them into a tiny little space, those molecules start banging into each other, creating friction. And that friction creates heat. And then when you pack all that heat in a really tiny little space, the temperature of that space goes up. And now we're talking going from about roughly 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit up to close to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the ignition point of diesel fuel is somewhere between 492 and 
the low sub hundreds, mid sub hundreds, depending on who you talk to. Um, according to the fire department, it's about 492 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Let's get this. So, so we're going to try and understand the operating theory of diesel engines as a foundation for proper maintenance and effective troubleshooting and repair. We're going to talk about the components of fire, compression ignition, fuel atomization, injection, the properties of diesel fuel, and the four-stroke cycle. All right, so our diesel engine is an internal combustion engine, which means there's a fire inside of a cylinder. So what's a cylinder? Well, a cylinder is basically a hole in the engine block. So depending on how many cylinders you have, depends on how many holes you have. So this is a three-cylinder engine up here. So it's got three of these cylinders. And inside those cylinders is going to be a piston. And this is not a matched pair, but that piston would be inside of the cylinder, which then has rings, piston rings on the outside of the piston, which are kind of spring-loaded, and they make a seal to the sidewalls of the cylinder. Now this particular piece is called a cylinder liner. So it's a removable and replaceable piece. So when you rebuild the engine, you can pull these sleeves out, and put brand new ones in with new pistons, and it brings the engine back to a brand new um, OEM specifications. But not all engines have liners. So some engines, you'd have to bore out the engines and go with oversized pistons and rings. All right, so we have a fire inside of that cylinder. And so anyone in here with firefighting training? Okay, so this is what's known as the fire triangle. So in order for fire to exist, three components have to be present. And that's why they use a triangle. There's three sides to the triangle. So here we have fuel. We have to have something to burn. In our case, it's going to be diesel fuel. Heat, that's the least obvious one of the three sides, and that is, uh, most people think of fire as giving off heat, but it actually requires heat in order for it to exist. I'm sure everyone's seen movies or whatever where people are trying to start their own fires and they take a stick, a little piece of wood, and they channel out a little spot, and they put little tiny fibers into that little, and they take that stick in there. And they're creating friction in that tiny little spot in that piece of wood until they create enough heat to cause those little fibers to catch on fire and then they, they try and get the fire out of it. So we're creating heat. Uh, so we need heat in order to have fire. And then here on this side of the triangle, it says air. If you look this up on the internet, it's not going to say air right there. It's going to say O2, which stands for oxygen. So, but our engines don't breathe pure oxygen. Our engines breathe a mixture of gases, which we call air. And the oxygen content can vary, which is very important for our diesel engines, how much oxygen they're getting. So we put air here because the, the oxygen uh, ranges. Uh, all right, so when all three sides are in proportion with each other, the engine runs fine, starts fairly easily, and the emissions coming out of the engine is nice and clean. But when these sides get out of balance, that's when we have a byproduct, and that byproduct is smoke. So when your diesel engine is smoking, there's usually something wrong in this fire triangle inside your engine. It could just be a single cylinder, it could be all the cylinders. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the air side of the triangle. That's usually the easiest one to troubleshoot. So on the air side of the triangle, we typically will have some sort of air filter. So on this engine, this engine here has a foam filter. This can get plugged up with uh, soot, belt dust. Um, some engines, the rooms have uh, sound insulation on them around the engines, which can be very old and it, it's like a foam and it will crumble and deteriorate and the engine will suck it in and clog these filters, which will restrict the air or oxygen going into the cylinder. So if we restrict how much air is going into the cylinder, we're not going to have enough oxygen for the amount of fuel we're spraying in. So we're going to be what we call running rich. We're rich, we have more fuel than oxygen. And so that fuel will get heated up, but it won't all burn. Because on a molecular level, each fuel molecule needs to be in contact with an oxygen molecule in order for that fuel to burn. 
And if we don't have enough oxygen for all the fuel we're spraying in, that fuel will get heated up, turn to carbon, but not burn. And not, the power won't be released out of that fuel and it'll come out of the exhaust as black smoke, which is carbon. Which you paid for that fuel and didn't put it to use. <laughs> So that's the air intake. We need to make sure we have a nice clean air going in. But that's only half of the air system. The other half is the exhaust. We have to get the exhaust out of the engine uh, quickly. If we can't get the exhaust out quickly, we're not going to be able to get the right amount of air or oxygen into the engine either. So we have to have a nice exhaust system. So this piece right here is what we call the exhaust mixing elbow. This is where we're injecting seawater into the exhaust gases to cool the exhaust gases down. So we can use a rubber hose to get the exhaust out of the boat. Now, this particular spot is a Achilles heel, especially for this particular engine, an engine brake. They usually use a cast iron mixing elbow, which cast iron tends to not last too, too long in the marine environment. Uh, first off, you got that hot spot with the exhaust running through it. So this exhaust is running anywhere between 300 and 1,000 degrees, 900 degrees. And we're injecting cool seawater compared to that exhaust. It might be around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which creates a cold spot in that metal. So if you're putting out any kind of carbon through that exhaust, that cold spot on that cast iron causes the carbon to stick to it. And over time, that carbon starts building up and closing the exhaust passageway. Uh, so then it starts hindering how much exhaust we can get out of the engine. So if we start limiting how much exhaust is getting out, we're going to limit how much air, clean air is getting in. And then it's going to be even more fuel air imbalance. And we're going to start even putting out more carbon. So then it's going to start closing off quicker. So here's an example of a mixing elbow here. You see the injection nipples broken off. The actual exhaust has crumbled. So it's actually about an inch and a half longer than you see it. This is the new replacement. It's a stainless steel exhaust now. And there's a fancy, uh, we'll call it exhaust blanket that's going to go over top of this. Uh, probably next week. <laughs> All right, so, so these, uh, this particular mixing elbow lasts anywhere between 5 and 15 years, depending on how you use the engine. Um, the condition of the bottom of the boat is very important, and you're running gear. So you need to keep the sea moss and marbles off the bottom of your boat, because that will add drag, which makes the engine work harder. And, with, and you'll overload the engine, and overloading an engine can produce black smoke also, which causes these to carbon up quickly. So this particular one you see on this engine right here, this is a stainless steel elbow. So this is an aftermarket uh, mixing elbow that we've installed in here. And it only runs maybe $50 more than the, the OEM or original EM or cast iron one. For $50, bucks, you can get 20 years out of it or more versus 5 to 15 years. So it's just worth the $50 to upgrade to the stainless. All right, so the exhaust hose coming out of the engine is a two-ply hose. So there's a hose inside of a hose, and there's wire wound in between those two layers, and the two layers are glued together. Now we have a pump on the front of the engine, maybe on the front of the engine, that has a rubber impeller in it, which is pulling seawater out <coughs> from the outside of the boat, and it runs it through the cooling passages on your engine. <coughs> and then we inject that seawater into the exhaust to cool the exhaust gases down. Now that rubber impeller is a serviceable item, and we recommend every other year of replacing it. You can replace it every year if you want, but you don't want to go past two years. It's easier to change it when you're sitting at the dock and you're tied up and there's no stress versus when you're out in the middle of the bay and you might be in a shipping channel you may have you know, four or five people on board with you and, and so you're stressed to try and get this 
and then it's easier to change it when it's all intact. So when all the blades are on the color, it's easier to just pop it out and put a nice fresh one in. Versus when they all break, all the blades break off, then you got to retrieve the broken pieces. Because if you don't retrieve the broken pieces, then that's going to create restrictions, and then you're going to have heating problems where you're going to start running hot <coughs> over here. And if you ever break your blades while you're at like cruise RPM, you're going to stop the flow of seawater into the exhaust. And then that exhaust is no longer going to be cooled properly, and that high temperature in that exhaust is going to cause that inner layer hose to blister and it's going to collapse in on itself. And you can look at the outside of the hose and you're not going to be able to tell there's anything wrong with it. <coughs> but when that collapses in on itself, that's going to create back pressure and it's not going to allow the exhaust to leave the engine quickly enough. And again, if you can't get the exhaust out quickly enough, we're not going to get the right amount of oxygen into the engine and we're going to create black smoke and a major loss of power. So if you ever break all your impeller blades, Always remove the, the hose from the mixing elbow. It's trying to light down in there. It's going to be, the damage is going to be in the first two feet. And you'll see blisters of the hose separation. And if you see that, go ahead and replace that, that section of hose. Because usually you'll have a muffler within three or four feet. And so it's not going to cost you hundreds of dollars to repair that, uh, that hose. All right. Some other things that can affect the air side of our triangle, um, elevation. So if you're boating up in the mountains, the higher in elevation you are, the thinner the air, the less oxygen for given volume. Um, that's usually not a problem with us. We're usually boating at sea level. And if you're below sea level, usually you have a moisture problem. <laughs> Unless you're submarine. And then the, the hardest one to troubleshoot on the air side of the triangle is what we call ambient engine room temperatures. The actual temperature of the air in the compartment that the engine's sitting in. Um, why is it so difficult? Well, you all have a, a smoking problem. You, you finally call a professional to come in to give you a hand. The professional comes down, greets you, gets on board. What's the next thing that professional does? The next thing that the next thing that the, the technician does is he opens up the compartment and he checks all your fluids and he looks around and he's like, all right, start it up. And you all know, start it up and then you untie and you go for a boat ride. On the boat ride, the engine behaves perfectly. Nothing, no smoke, no nothing. You come back, he closes everything up, receives his money goes, you take the boat out, and boom, the smoke's back. Why do you think that is? The air long the engine's too high. Because when the technician was on board, he opened up the compartment so he can look at it while you're on seat trial, which then opened the engine compartment up to a completely another room of cool air, so we were feeding cool air to that compartment, and so the problem went away. So who here has a blower on their boat? When do you use your blower? The answer on a diesel engine is you run that blower when the engine's running. Because that on a diesel boat, that blower is there to evacuate heat from the compartment. On a gas boat, it's there to evacuate uh, um, combustible vapors, gasoline vapors, explosive vapors. So on a gas boat, you, start, you run the blowers 10 to 15 minutes before you start the engine, and then you shut it off after the engine's running. But on a diesel engine, you turn it on while the engine's running because it pulls heat out of the compartment. And if you ever paid attention uh, between the two types of uh, boats, the gasoline flower hoses go to the very bottom of the compartment because gas vapors sink. And a diesel boat, the, the hose should be at the top of the compartment because hot air rises. So it's going to pull the heat from the top of the compartment. So one way to troubleshoot this ambient air temperature, uh, high ambient air temperature, is to go to your uh, home and garden center and you buy one of those indoor-outdoor um, garden displays. It's a wireless sensor. You can put that sensor in the compartment at the top, close it up, then the panel, put that panel by the helm, and you go for a boat ride, and then you can see what the temperature of the compartment is actually running at. 
Now you want to see temperatures below 130 degrees Fahrenheit. The cooler, the better. So you really want to be seeing under 120. So that's the air side of the triangle. But we could have a problem on the fuel side of the triangle. So there's a few things in the fuel side of the triangle that can uh, cause problems. We've got, we've got fuel injectors. Uh, we've got a fuel injection pump. It's an injection pump off a three-cylinder engine. So what can go wrong with our injectors? So, so we have our tips. These are also known as nozzles. So we've got two different types of fuel injection. Not that it matters to you all at this point. Um, so we've got this narrow pointy injection tip, and then we've got this cylinder style injection tip. So the, the cylinder style is usually used in what we call engines that have a pre-combustion chamber. So there's a little chamber that the fuel is sprayed in before it enters the cylinder. And actually all the combustion happens in that little pre-combustion cup. The narrow pointy one is what we call direct injection, where the fuel is sprayed directly on top of the piston. Like I said, it doesn't really matter which one you have, you can't change it. But all modern engines are moving towards direct injection because it uses higher fuel pressure. The higher the fuel pressure, the finer the mist that it sprays out. The finer the mist, the cleaner the burn. It's all EPA driven. So, in this nozzle, there's a needle, also known as a pintle. And you can see there's a tapered edge on the very bottom edge of this, this uh, nozzle. Now, when the injection pump delivers high pressure fuel, that high pressure fuel is going to go down through a tiny little passage, and that fuel pressure then tries to get under that taper and lift this needle up off its seat and then the fuel sprays out. What prevents that needle from lifting off its seat is a big heavy duty spring. You can see we have this big fat heavy duty spring. So what happens to springs over time? They get weaker. So let's say this injector is supposed to spray fuel when it receives 2400 PSI. But we've got a weak spring now. So instead of requiring 2,400 PSI to spray fuel, maybe it only requires 2,000 PSI. What's happening? It's opening early and closing late. So that spring's pushing down on that needle. And so it normally it's supposed to require 2,400 PSI to cause that spring to compress before the fuel will spray out. And when the fuel pressure drops below that 2400, then the spring pushes down and shuts the fuel delivery off. But now it's opening at 2000, so it's spraying early, and then it needs to drop below 2000 before it shuts off. So now we're, we've got a longer period that we're spraying fuel in, so now we're delivering more fuel than it was designed to, and we're going to have some smoking, black smoke problems. So this is an injection pump. This is what delivers the fuel to the engine. So here we have what we call plungers. This sits on top of a camshaft. And we're getting into anatomy a little bit. So what's a camshaft? Well, it's a shaft with cams on it. <laughs> well, what's a cam? Reader's Digest version of what a cam is, it's a pump. So it's a shaft with bumps on it. So every time that bump comes around, it pushes on something. In this case, it's going to push up on this plunger, and when it does that, it's going to squeeze that fuel through a really tiny hole, which is going to take low pressure fuel that's being delivered by the low pressure pump, and it's going to take that low pressure fuel, push it through a little hole, which is going to drive the pressure way high by pushing it through a tiny hole. And so we can have problems with our plungers not delivering the right amount of fuel pressure. So that is it, uh, could be a problem. And then the atomization coming out of the injector. 
we want a fine of a mist as we can possibly get. And so if we think about some of the sprays we were familiar with, so I'm sure everyone has a Windex bottle and they pump that, that little trigger and it kind of puts out this splatter type of spray out of it. That's not what we want. What we want is like an air freshener can. When you spray that air freshener can, and it's that fine mist coming out. That's what we're looking to get out of our injectors. To help, to help us realize this, I'm going to give an analogy of a campfire. So I'm going to put a fire pit in the front of the room here. I'm going to cut a log about 18 inches long, maybe about 5 inches in diameter. I'm going to put that log in the fire pit. I'm going to light that log on fire. What part of that log is burning? The outside. The outside. Why? That's the only part of the fuel that's in contact with oxygen. The inside of that log might be hot enough to burn, but there's no oxygen there. So it's pretty much just going to smolder, um, but it's not going to flame. Now, and that's going to put off a certain amount of heat, which we can measure in BTUs, British thermal units. Um, so it's going to put out a, a certain amount of heat off of that measured amount of fuel. But if I took that same log and I split it into five pieces, put that into the fire pit, lit that on fire, same exact amount of fuel, and now I'm going to have a lot more heat and fire coming off of that. Now if I took those five pieces and I ran it through a wood chipper, again, same amount of fuel, lit that on fire to have even more heat. Now if I took the wood chips and turned it into sawdust, lit that on fire and have a real quick big fireball and it'd be done. So we're trying to get the sawdust out of our injectors and not the log. And so and so we we talked about the electronic computer these uh, common rail engines. Their fuel pressure, so a typical mechanical fuel injection, the fuel pressure the high fuel pressure system runs anywhere between two and 4,000 PSI. On an electronic common rail engine, that fuel pressure is going to be 20 to 60,000 PSI. And so when the fuel comes out of the injectors on a common rail engine, it's no longer a mist. It's so fine, it's like cigarette smoke. And that's why our engines are moving towards that because of the EPA, because it gets a nice, cleaner, way cleaner burn. Excuse me, what did you say the pressure was on mechanical? Anywhere between two and 4,000. You said the, the engines that typically have a pre-combustion chamber are closer to the 2,000 range, oh. and the, the ones with direct injector is usually closer to the 4,000, three to 4,000. All right, the heat side of our triangle, we, we generate our heat through the compression of air. So some things that can affect the, the compression is again, we have to have a good surface inside of our cylinder, and we have to have a good seal with our, our rings to the cylinder walls. And also at the top of the cylinder, here's a cylinder head. On the top of the cylinder, we'll have valves. So each cylinder will have an intake valve and an exhaust valve. And those valves are seated into the cylinder head. So those seats can get pitted, they can get uh, worn, worn away, and you can start losing compression past those seats. And so we need a, a really good tight cylinder in order to have proper compression so we can create enough heat. Some engines are designed to be on a little bit lower end of the heat range. And on those engines, you may have glow plugs. So these are little electrical devices that we utilize before we actually start the engines. And so, so you have a glow plug or a preheat circuit. And so we'll put power to these for anywhere in the modern engines. These run, about, run for about 10 seconds. Um, the older engines, it can be as much as 20 to 35 seconds. Um, so this little piece sticking off here is, if you think back to uh, 
back in the 80s and 90s where you had the old electric stove, the coil stoves that would glow bright orange. That's what this material is made out of. It's going to glow bright orange and it's going to be screwed into the pre-combustion chamber and it's going to preheat that uh, pre-combustion chamber. But there are some engines that have direct in injection that also have preheaters. But typically, if you have glow plugs, most of the time you have to use them in order to get the engine started when it's cold. So that could be a reason why your engine doesn't start on cold. But once the engine's up at operating temperature and you shut it off, and you get started again, you don't need to actually use your glow plug. I mean, but some engines you have to use it in order to get the engine to crank. So it's an interlock that you have to press that. Um, something else that affects the heat side of the triangle, engine cranking speed. That engine has to be cranking quickly to compress that air quickly. Otherwise, if, you, if it's cranking slowly, the compression is going to leak past the rings and you're not going to build the heat that's required to uh, start that engine. So we got to make sure that we have a good battery, battery cables, and a starter so we get this engine spinning as quickly as we can. Question. Did you say so you're building up the heat in the, in the chamber so that you expand the rings? No, I missed it. We're creating heat in the cylinder so that when we spray atomized fuel into that cylinder, it auto-ignites. Okay. So we don't have a spark plug to ignite our or, or fuel. So even with the glow plug, you need, you need those. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you might get a gas engine to start with a weak battery. There's a spark. But on a diesel engine, it'll, it'll just crank until your battery is dead dead. So, so the glow plug heats the fuel. Hmm? It heats the fuel in the pre combustion. No, it's heating the air. Air, okay. All right, diesel fuel is more like vegetable oil than it is to gasoline, which is a little difficult for a lot of people to wrap their minds around because they both get pumped out of the ground, they both get refined, and the stock market prices affect both of them equally, and they're sold side by side, sometimes even at the same pump um, at the fuel stations. But in reality, our, our diesel fuel is more like vegetable oil. So you can think about putting that diesel pump in your kitchen. So, so the, um, the vegetable oil, your engine actually can run off the vegetable oil once. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem with it is it's a little too thick. And so when it's cold, it's not, it's not going to flow through the system correctly. Um, there are people that uh, convert their old Volkswagen Rabbit diesels and their old 300D Mercedes, and they put a second tank in the in the vehicle, which then they put um, filtered um, fire fat um, into it, and it's a pretty big. I mean, it's not difficult to do, but it can get kind of complicated. So there's a couple of electric fuel valves that you you start the engine on regular diesel fuel, and once that fire fat's heated up, then you can flip the electric switch, which then electric fuel valve switch over to the fryer fat tank and then you start running the engine off of the fryer fat. Um, then you get to your destination and you got to hit the switch again and sit there for about 15-20 minutes to flush out all that fryer fat so when you go to start that engine again it'll start back up. So it's it's uh, not really great for running up to 7-Eleven but if you're on a long trip um, it can make a difference um, to the use of recycled um, fuels. And diesel fuel is a lot safer than gasoline also. So if I took a, a bucket of diesel fuel and put it in the front of the classroom here, and I struck a match, and I threw a match into that diesel fuel bucket, the match would actually go out. When it hits the surface, you may see a spark, but it'll immediately uh, get extinguished. Now, if I put a bucket of gasoline in front of <laughs> besides everyone running out here and calling the cops on me, when I struck that match and threw it at that bucket, the, the match wouldn't even make it to the bucket before the vapors coming off of the gasoline uh, is going to ignite and then we'll have a big uh, fireball. So, 
Well, not to that extent. <laughs> not with a five gallon bucket. Uh, so, so uh, that's why diesel engines are way safer for boats than, than gas engines. There's a lot of energy in diesel fuel. So this was a study done by the U.S. Department of Energy. And uh, so here you can see the, the top bill goes to regular diesel fuel. And here we got biodiesel. Here's gasoline. Was that 922? But that's not what we can buy in Maryland. Uh, we have ethanol in our fuel. So that would be E85. That's at 690. So look at how much more gasoline we have to burn to do the same amount of work as diesel fuel. And then down here you got your propane, some liquid natural gases, and then down here we have the batteries. That's why the electric boat doesn't work yet. It's just not a lot of, not enough energy in it. So I mean, they are advancing um, with the lithium um, batteries and stuff, but it's still, there's not a rechargeable method yet um, to recharge, um, to make the electric motors work properly in a boat. So your range is not long enough for like cruisers and stuff. All right, we're so gonna talk about Boyle's Law, auto ignition, and compression ratios. Here's Boyle. Don't really need to remember this formula, but it was, it's his formula that uh, Rudolf Diesel used. So it basically he came up with the, the uh, formula for that there's a relationship between pressures, volumes, and temperature which is the basically to take a volume of air, you compress it rapidly, the temperature is going to go up. And I believe the modern um, formula has another variable in it, which I'm not a physicist, so I can't help you with that. All right, compression ratios. How much are we compressing that air? On a diesel engine, it can range from like 17 to 1 up to about 24 to 1 compression ratio. Um, you think about your car that you drove in here, it's probably somewhere between 7 to 1 and 10 to 1 compression ratios. I think Honda has been playing around with their compression ratios and they're starting to climb on theirs a little bit. And I think they made a gasoline engine that is a sparkless. If you have a diesel engine in your car, are the compression ratios more similar or? Yeah. Is it diesel to gas is difference or is it car to? No, it's diesel to gas. Not diesel. Diesel will all need that higher compression to create the extra heat. All right, so here's a 20, 20 to 1 compression ratio. So how much are we squeezing that air? And this is graphically accurate. So that piston is going to compress that air to 1 20th original size. And so we're going to go from roughly 70 degrees Fahrenheit to almost 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if we know the ignition point of diesel fuels, anywhere between 500 and 7, 700 or so, so when we spray that fuel, atomized fuel in that hot environment, it's going to auto-ignite. Some vocabulary. The lowest point of travel the piston makes in the cylinder is what we call bottom dead center. The highest point of travel in the cylinder is what we call top dead center. And the difference between the two is our, our ratio. So you can see this is direct injection. We got our fuel tip at the very top, spraying a fuel mist in the, on the top of the piston. And when that auto ignites, that fuel, you're gonna have the expansion of gases. And that expansion of the gases is gonna cause that piston to be forced down. And at that moment in time, we've taken fuel, air, and heat and converted it to mechanical force. And the rest of it is about trying to get that mechanical force to the propeller so we can turn that propeller to move the boat. And this is what we call the power stroke on our four-stroke cycle. So one of those strokes is the power stroke. Now, if you're from Europe, they don't call it the power stroke. They call it the expansion stroke. But here in the U.S., it's all about muscle. <laughs> All right, so here we have two different types of fuel injection. Again, we have direct injection, where the fuel is spraying directly on top of the piston, and we have indirect injection, where it sprays into a pre-combustion chamber. So the fire actually happens inside that pre-combustion chamber, and then it spills out 
into the top of the piston and then expands the rest of the way. All right, mechanical versus electronic. So a mechanical fuel injected engine, the engineers have taken a bunch of variables and designed this engine around it. And those variables might be that the, the outside temperature is going to be 90 degrees, the internal temperatures of the engine is going to be 180 degrees, the, uh, the exhaust temperature is going to be X, the, so all these barometric pressures, all, they've taken all these variables and they're designing this engine to run in those variable readings. The problem is, is when those variables change, then the engine doesn't run right or doesn't perform right. So this engine may have been designed to run in 80 to 90 degree temperatures. It's 32 degrees out today. If I start this engine, it's probably going to smoke and smoke and smoke because the variables are all out of whack. But with the electronic engines, there's a computer and there's sensors all around that engine. And the computer's talking to all those sensors, and the sensors are telling that computer uh, the cylinders are cold, the air temperature going into the manifold is cold, so only spray this much fuel into the cylinder so we don't create smoke. And so that the computer's always changing the variables on its, or the variables are always changing the fuel injection on, 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 the, on, the, on the fly. And so a mechanical engine, the injector only sprays once. So it sprays out its fuel and that's it. On an electronic engine, that injector can spray up to seven times on one power strip, which is amazing how quickly that can happen. You think the engine's running at 2,500 RPMs, Someone can do the math in here, I'm sure. <laughs> That's a lot of spraying <laughs> in, in, uh, in a minute. All right, so we got the good and the bad. So here's some in injector sprays. So I think the flash made this look like there's a, a gap right there, but it's a fairly even cone and mist coming out. In this one, you can see there's like major gaps, a really hard spot of thick spray coming out. And so this would be closer to the log, and this would be the sawdust. And so your injectors are supposed to be on a service schedule. So it depends, so it depends on your maintenance schedule as to when they're supposed to be pulled out and tested. And so, and that's usually anywhere between 800 and 1200 hours. You pull them out and you test them. Because what we're looking for again when we test them is spray patterns and how much pressure was required to to make them spray. Alright, so here we got direct injection. So here we got a blow plug. You can see the tip is glowing bright orange. This has been cut away, the piston's cut away. And this little cup in the top of it is what we call a swirl cup. And so when the piston's coming up, it causes the air to swirl in a tiny little cup. And then you can see the spray coming out of the injector is going the opposite direction. And so you get a better mixture of the air and the fuel because they're opposing each other. That is good bang. All right, so black smoke is caused by running rich. It can be caused by defective spray patterns, high ambient engine room temperatures, insufficient air either going into the cylinder or leaving the engine through the exhaust. An electronic fuel injection will help stop this because the computer won't allow it. And if the computer can't fix it on its own, then it will put you into a fault mode and, uh, and limit how many RPMs you can get out of the engine, what we call limp mode. It'll let you limp back to the dock to get a repair done. Do you typically see issues with something like this with it? it at the end of the day, is it typically one or two injectors, or is it all of them that are having issues? What's, what's typical? Yeah. Well, something like this is going to be more of uh, an overload. So this picture could actually have just been a temporary overload, where the captain may have just you know, tried to get up on plane. And so you're, you have a temporary overload until the RPMs catch up with the, the fuel you're spraying in with your throttle position. 
Um, but if it's constantly doing this, then I would be suspect of that you have a foul bottom and running gear that your bottom of the boat needs to be cleaned. So I can't tell you how many times every year we get, I get a phone call saying that I'm blowing black smoke and my first question to the to person is, when was the last time you had the bottom clean? And they're always like, oh, we just had a fresh bottom put on. When was that? In April. Well, it's July now. I think you should get the bottom checked. Get, get a short call, get them the power washing, scrape some barnacles, and, and test it again. Because otherwise, I could be coming down to the boat chasing my tail when there's nothing wrong with the engine. It's, it's, the engine's running overloaded. And sure enough, a week or two later, get a call or email, you were right. And that, that happens like 10 times a year to where we, I get that phone call of, of smoking. And usually hand in hand with the smoking, when you have a foul bottom, you usually have higher engine temperatures. When you're loading, overloading the engine, the temperatures of the engine run, run warmer too. All right, what's a stroke, a four-stroke cycle? So what is a stroke? A stroke is the movement of the piston either down the cylinder as a stroke and up the cylinder as a stroke. So a four-stroke cycle is going to be down, up, down, up to complete one full cycle of one cylinder. So the intake stroke, so remember we've got the valves in the cylinder head. So the valve will open for the intake, the piston will pull down. And that piston is going to create negative pressure where it's going to draw air into the cylinder. Just like your diaphragm does. The diaphragm pulls down and pulls air into your lungs. So it's going to pull a, a fresh charge of air into the cylinder, then that valve is going to close. And that's the end of the intake stroke. And the next stroke is the compression stroke. Now we have a sealed cylinder, the piston comes up, compresses all that air, creates the heat. Just before the piston gets all the way to the top, we start injecting the atomized fuel. Then the atomized fuel ignites, we get the expansion of gases, the piston's forced down, that's our power stroke. Now we've got a cylinder full of smoke, exhaust valve opens, piston comes up, and pushes all the exhaust into the exhaust manifold and out the rest of the exhaust system. So every diesel class ever taught teaches you using four words on how to remember these four strokes. Suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so this is what it looks like. So we've got the little arrows on the piston showing you the direction of the movement and the stroke is the entire movement of the piston, not just this frozen period of time. So this is one cylinder going through all the four strokes. So you've got the intake valve open, piston pulls down, valves close, the piston comes up, compresses all the air just before this ends its stroke. We start injecting the fuel, we get the expansion of gases, forces the piston down the power stroke, exhaust valve opens, piston pushes up, blows all the smoke, out of the solar. I'm talking about two shirts. Right. Any questions? I'm sure that's going to be We talked about the four stroke. That's for one cylinder. So if there are multiple cylinders, how's that occurring? Well, there's a firing order. So um, on, a four, on a four cylinder engine, there'll be one cylinder on each stroke of the four cycles. So on a four cylinder engine, the uh, pistons run in pairs. So number one and four are running together, and two and three are running together, but they're on opposite strokes. So when number one is on intake, that means number four will be on power. And then the center two would be on the opposite. So one would be on compression, the other would be on exhaust. So does that mean on an eight cylinder, two of them are firing at the same time, or is it like a gas engine where only one cylinder is actually firing? At only one time? cylinder at a time. Can you touch on turbochargers and how that fits in the Um. Um. 
right, so here is a naturally aspirated um, diagram. So we have manifolds, an intake manifold and an exhaust manifold. A manifold is just a fancy word for a chamber that has either a single entrance and multiple exits, or the opposite, multiple entrances and a single exit. So everyone comes in contact, hopefully, every day with a manifold. And every time you go to a sink, you got hot and cold, that is a manifold where you're mixing hot and cold water together and it comes out a single location. So we got cool, fresh air going in, going through the combustion cycle, into the exhaust, and then out. That's naturally aspirated. So the movement of the air throughout the engine is done by the movement of the piston only. So we get a certain amount of horsepower out of that process. But the exhaust coming out of this engine is under pressure and it's hot. So there's energy there that can be captured. And if we bolt a turbocharger onto that exhaust, that turbocharger has a, um, a turbine in it, kind of like a pinwheel that you used to get at the county fair. So as the exhaust pushes past that turbine, it spins it. And then the exhaust then leaves and goes to the mixing elbow and out the rest of the the exhaust system. And so that's all in a housing here on the turbo. Then there's a second housing, and then there's a shaft connecting the exhaust housing to the intake housing. And there's another pinwheel on the intake housing. So the exhaust turbine is driving the intake turbine, which is pulling air in and blowing air into the exhaust manifold. So it's pressurizing that um, into the intake manifold, and it's pressurizing that intake manifold. So naturally aspirated, we can the piston can draw in a certain amount of oxygen at a time. But if we pressurize that manifold, we can actually cram more oxygen into that cylinder because we're pressurizing the air into it. And so if we get more oxygen into that cylinder. That means we can actually put more fuel into that cylinder and get a bigger bang and more horsepower out of this same engine. But that turbocharger is blowing compressed air into that intake. What do we know about compressed air? It's hot. It's hot air. So we're blowing hot air into that intake manifold and into the cylinders. So we're getting a net gain because we can push more of that and cram more of that oxygen into that cylinder than the, the piston can normally just draw it in through vacuum. But we're blowing hot air in. And we know hot air, there's less oxygen per given volume because the molecules are further spread apart. That's why hot air rises and cold air sinks. Hot air rises because the molecules are further apart. Cold air sinks because they're more compact together and they're heavier and they, and they sink. So what if before we blow that hot air into the intake manifold, we blow that hot air into a box. And inside that box, we have a bunch of pipes and we run cool seawater through those pipes. And we blow this hot air over these cool pipes and we remove the heat from that compressed air. Now we're going to cram even more oxygen into that cylinder and then we can put even more fuel into that cylinder and get an even bigger bang. That box is called an aftercooler, so turbocharged aftercool. And so we always get the, the question where, you know, my turbo doesn't kick in until you know, X amount of RPMs. Well, that's not really true. Your turbocharger is always spinning. But you got to remember, the piston is creating negative pressure, right? So I don't know what that number is. I'm not a, an engineer, but it's creating negative pressure. And so the turbo pressure has to overcome that negative pressure before it starts providing what we call a boost pressure into that intake manifold. So that may require 1,700 to 1,900 RPMs before that positive boost pressure is achieved. And in some engines, the governor may have a, uh, a hose going to it to where it requires a certain amount of boost pressure to move this little diaphragm so the governor can deliver more fuel um, until that boost pressure is there. It's going to limit how much that injection pump delivers to the injectors. 
Did that answer that? <laughs> Any other questions? It's a short question and answer. Is it true that diesels produce uh, less carbon monoxide? Why would that be so? Uh, I mean, it's the, is it the carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. That's, that's, that's a good question. I should know the answer to it. But I'm more about performing. I mean, you just make sure that it's exhausting out of the boat. Not in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> so you said for Um, well, if it's old school, then you know, it depends on how many compartments are attached to that engine compartment. So do you have a, you talk about a sailboat or a powerboat? Power. Powerboat. On the side of the engine rooms typically are, um, on the outside of the boat, you usually have like these vent and louvers. And so when the boat's moving through the water, or, um, it's grabbing air and forcing, air is being forced into the compartment because of, it's got the little vents and then on the other side of the compartment usually it, it's where the air can actually leave the compartment so it allows the cool air to circulate through that compartment. Is doing regular maintenance on the engine and taking a look at stuff, I mean if you, if you get to a point where you can put eyes on that turbocharger and look inside there, what are you looking for, what are any signs of hey you might need a call, right, it's obviously it's going to be there's going to be some dirt in there. There's going to be dirty in there. It's not going to be squeaky clean. But what what causes alarm? What are you looking for that there might be an issue? Um, well, there used to be a a procedure that you know, Yamar used to recommend to all their turbochargers, and they used to have a chemical that you could spray into the intake of the turbocharger to help clean it, which you had to do on a sea trial, but. For whatever reason, that is no longer available. I'm guessing it wasn't EPA approved anymore, and you can't buy that stuff anywhere. Um, but with the engine off, you pull the intake or the air filter off the turbo, and you can put your finger on the turbine blade and kind of spin it with your finger. It should move pretty easily. If it's sluggish, if there's a lot of oil on it, then you probably want to get it cleaned. Yeah, that requires pulling it and it out. Well, I mean, you can try and clean it. Um, I mean, they're they're saying to, to use spray water into it now, which I, I'm, I don't know about that. But that's what they're saying is spray water into it while the engine's running on sea trial, and you spray water and that will help clean the the, the turbo. Um, another test you can do is you can check for boost pressure. So you, on the intake manifold, you can put a gauge and see how much boost it's actually pr producing when you're at on sea trial. And that can kind of give you an idea that there's a, an issue with your turbo. When would I consider fuel polishing? When your fuel's old, or if you're having um, a lot of filter clogging, your primaries get clogged quite often, or you're getting a lot of water separation in your primary fuel filter. So if everything's running just fine, it all changes when I'm running on the last inch or two of my fuel tank? Well, the lower the level of the fuel, the more the fuel is going to be sloshing around and dislodging any um, microbes that are clung to the sidewalls of the tank. And that will stir it up. So the concentration of the dirt to fuel in the tank is going to be a lot higher. So that's going to clog the filters. So if you keep the tank full, there's going to be less sloshing, so less um, debris being dislodged. Right. And, and the growth is in there anyway, right? Where that polish the fuel. Yeah, if it's already in there, it's in there. And polishing the fuel won't help. Oh, it'll, it'll help. It'll maybe not eliminate, but it will extend the, the clogging of your filters over time. So is it something I should do every so often? If it's required, and I'm, I'm, I don't. For me, if you're using your your tank and you're going through fuel, you probably don't need to do it. But if your boat is you know, 
20, 30 years old, original tank, maybe you do it. Are you getting, when you change your filters, are they dirty? Okay, thanks. I mean, if, you're, if your fil filters are clean, then, then I don't really see the need to spend four or five hundred dollars to get it polished. Thank you very much. And the tank is only like a 15, 20 gallon tank, you might just pump it out and just put fresh fuel in it. But fuel's but, fine over the winter as long as you have fuel. fuel yeah. Tank. Yeah, so we like to store our fuel tanks full to keep the void, air void at the top of the tank. The smaller it is, the less moisture is going to be moving in and out of that tank. And that's where the problems happen, is when you get the moisture into the tank through the vent. And so the moisture goes into the tank, starts clinging to the top of the tank, creates water droplets, and then the water drops into the fuel. And then that's when you get the microbes growing. You know, all the magazines call it um, algae, but there's no algae in diesel fuel. Algae requires sunlight to grow. So we have microbes that grow. Uh, and, and so the, a few things that affect the microbes, again, water usually needs to be present. And the warmer the weather, the quicker they grow. So here in the mid-Atlantic, it's a mediocre issue up in Maine. Not so much of an issue at all, but if you're down in Florida or the Caribbean, you know, it, it can be you know, pretty hazardous you know, to your fuel system. So does, do I need two stabilizers, the bioside and the stabilizer, or? I mean, I'm not, I don't push any particular fuel product, um, but the, 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 the main products you may need to use are lubricity products, um, biocides, and <coughs> cetane improvers. Cetane. I mean, cetane is like octane is for gas. So cetane is a catalyst which helps diesel fuel burn. And you really only need to worry about cetane is if your fuel is old. So if your fuel is you know one to two years old or, or older, then that cetane rating drop, gradually drops over time, which makes that fuel harder and harder to burn. And so you could have old fuel, which will cause the diesel engine to smoke. It'll put out this like bluish smoke. And, uh, and so if you replace that fuel or add cetane improvers to that fuel, that smoking may go away. It's just that the older you store that diesel fuel, the more it tries to turn itself back into crude oil. Crude oil. What else causes uh, smoke to change colors and what do those colors indicate? Okay, three colors of smoke is black, which we talked about. It's a fuel air, a fuel air imbalance, running rich. Um, blue smoke is typically burning oil. So you're consuming oil and burning oil that produces blue smoke. And white smoke is either uh, insufficient um, temperatures in the cylinder, so you're not creating enough heat to actually ignite the fuel, so it puts out this whitish smoke. So on cold days, when the cylinders are really cold, you'll usually see smoking, and then once the engine warms up, it typically will go away. And then you have steaming, which is a completely separate from smoke. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the steam? Can you see the steam coming out from the exhaust? Okay, all that is will steam a little bit, um, but when you start getting heavier amounts of steam, usually that means there's going to be a restriction in your seawater flow through the engines. And so you're not putting enough seawater into that exhaust to cool the exhaust down. And so the water that you are injecting into that exhaust is boiling and turning to steam. Your thoughts on the, uh, a rebuild of Um, well, rebuilding will save you some money, um, but you got to think about what engine manufacturer it is. How long are they around? I mean, are they almost out of business? You said Universal Westerby. They're unless someone buys into them and pushes a lot of money into them, they're going to phase away. <laughs> I think so. Um, 
but um, but like you said, you know, you, there's a replacement engine, you know, Beta Marine. They they use the Kubota engines, so that will fit basically in the same spot. Um, but if you rebuild your your engine, I mean, it is just a Kubota engine, so you can get Kubota parts for it for the internals. It's just the accessories which are universal, which can be an issue trying to get those parts. Um, so typically, when you rebuild an engine, it'll probably be maybe 80% of the cost of the new engine purchase, um, but and it's not going to really have much of a warranty on the rebuild, and it's still not a new engine. It's it's a 40-year-old engine that has been has been rebuilt, and everyone's version of a rebuild is different. You know, so my rebuild might be different from some other shops rebuild. You know, I tend to go through every single system and put all new parts in the cooling system, et cetera, et cetera. All the injection system gets rebuilt. Um, some people just, you know, re, re, uh, rebuild the cylinders and the crankshaft and, and the cylinder head and all the accessories are not gone through. So it's, there are different variations of, of what you consider a rebuild. Yeah. Yeah, so when you go to buy a rebuild engine, you don't really know what you're buying. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the longevity is to buy the new one, but you do have the added cost of labor is a lot more to put a new engine in versus putting the exact same engine into the boat that you pulled out. Because there, you, know, you got engine bed works, shaft work, maybe exhaust system design. Um, so, you know, so putting in an engine that the exact same engine that pulled out, you can probably get that done in eight to ten hours. You know, to, to put it in on the line, where putting a brand new engine into the boat is going to range between forty and eighty hours, depending on the on the boat. Because you're not putting apples and apples, you're putting apples and oranges. So, there's a lot more. Work involved. Yeah, the labor is probably as much Well, the labor typically runs anywhere between 55 and 7,500. And then miscellaneous parts can be anywhere between 1,500 and 4,500. And the, the way parts have skyrocketed since COVID, I mean, typically a stainless steel shaft propeller shaft was you know, 600 to 7, now they're like $1,200 for building one inch you know, by a five foot shaft. Prices have really increased. You may have answered this before. Do you recommend using a stabilizer whenever you fill up with people? Um, I mean, I don't like stabilizers, um, but what you may need to use would be if you want to use a biocide for the microbial issues um, or um, lubricity products. Now, the reason you would use a lubricity product is because they are removing sulfur from our diesel fuel. And the sulfur um, is a pollutant. So they're removing it out of the fuel and the and we're seeing issues with our fuel systems because of the removal of that sulfur. So we're seeing more and more issues with our injection pumps, any rubber component in the fuel system. So we got rubber o-rings and seals in our injection pumps, our um, mechanical fuel pumps, this is what pumps the fuel from the tank to the high side, it's a rubber diaphragm, we're seeing those stretch out and get holes in them, and so, so we're starting to see a, a lot of problems because of the lack of sulfur in the fuels now. And so you can add a lubricity product back in which helps um, keep that rubber at bay from being stretched out and deteriorating. Is there a common name for this, the product? Biocide, or not biocide, mm -hmm. lubricity. Yeah, yeah just, just look up diesel fuel lubricity pop products. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've read that uh, you can put a, uh, some amount of two stroke oil in the fuel to increase the uh, lubricity. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, <laughs> there was a study done back in like 2008 or so, uh, and they, they tested all these different products, 
And some of them was two cycle oil, some of it was used engine oil, um, and all these different lubricity products. And the best thing that they found for lubricity issues was using bio or bio biofuel. So adding uh, a B2 to the fuel was a, the best lubricant you could add. The problem is, is trying to find biofuel is a little more difficult because it's not available everywhere. <clears throat> and the other thing to know about um, biofuels is uh, microbes can't grow in it. So it's also a biocide. Um, well, every engine manufacturer is probably going to have a different temperature range they want their engines running at, so it can be anywhere between 160 and 195, depending on the engine manufacturer. Um, so it, even if you know that the engine has like a 160 degree thermostat in it, it's still going to run probably 10 degrees warmer than that rated, because it's not fully open until like 168 degrees. And so running at 175, to 180, it will be normal for that particular engine. <coughs> well, most engines, once you start seeing one in the 190 range, then that's something to start. Hey, what's what's happening? So it could be a problem on your roller side, or it could be a problem on your coolant side. And so it's pretty important on the coolant side. We have our, our heat exchanger. This one has the heat exchanger built into the manifold here. And most people think of the issues on the heat exchangers being on the seawater side, which is the untrue. Most issues with heat exchangers on the antifreeze side. There are chemicals in antifreeze that will separate out of the antifreeze and create a slime barrier on the tubes. And so the heat has to go from the antifreeze through the slime, through the Cooper nickel tube to the seawater. And that slime barrier doesn't allow enough um, heat transfer. It may be okay at, at your cruise RPM, but once you start going above cruise, you start seeing that temperature climbing. And so you pull the heat exchanger out and then you dip it in some sort of chemical, depending on what your heat exchanger is made, made out of as to whether you have to use a low-end, um, not aggressive chemical, or whether you can use like muriatic acid, which is a really aggressive chemical. If you have an electronic or computer-run engine and it goes up to 190, does it limit the RPM as a governor, or it doesn't have to do that? Uh, more likely, it's just going to give you a fault warning code. Like a light or something? Yeah. So on your, on your panel, it'll it will tell you code 06 and basically what it is and probably give you a little beeping to notify you that you know, something happened. So in the mixing of you mentioned you can get carbon build up and restrict it. Is that something you chip out easily or is that set up like concrete in it? Chipping out is a get home <laughs> or, right, repair. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you run the risk when you chip it out because it's cold. It's basically going to be cold. Mm -hmm. And like I said, these elbows would be cast iron. So when you're chipping that coal out, that cast iron, because it's so old and heated, gets brittle. Mm -hmm. So as you're chipping that coal away, that screwdriver can bust right through into the coolant passage or the seawater passage. So then when the next time you start the engine, that seawater then can push into the exhaust dry side and then it gets down into your cylinders and then you. Then we got a big expense happening. What's the maintenance recipe to reduce the buildup of that uh, slime in a coolant just to maintain the temperature of the engine? Or is it just to keep the engine running at that temperature? Yes. So we recommend changing your antifreeze every, every two to three years. And then at the thousand hour maintenance service, most engines that's pulling the coolers off and dipping them in the acid and then reinstalling them. And is pulling the coolers off? I mean, you want to remove it from the engine so you can clean it really good. Because otherwise, 
I mean, you can try and use like a radiator flush like you do on a car, but it, it's not very aggressive and it's not going to clean the way you want it to clean. On my boat, from the exhaust, it goes into this white box. I think they call it the aqua lift. Well, what's in that? And what does that do? And what's after that? There's nothing in it. <laughs> it's a water lift muffler. So it's a, it's a big empty chamber. The outlet, there's a tube going down. So there's a, a tube, or in this case, it's a baffle. The exhaust and seawater enter the, the can. Once the water level gets above that baffle, then the pressure builds up. Once enough pressure builds up, then it blows the water up and out of the engine, or out of the exhaust system. So that's why on the outside of the boat, at low speeds, you'll see a pulse of water. Whoosh, whoosh. That's this water lift muffler doing its job. Building up pressure, then releasing it. Building up pressure, then releasing it. Because we want to exhaust above the water line. Because if we exhaust below the water line, then all that water is creating back pressure on our engine. And again, remember, back pressure is going to limit how much air we can get into the engine. It's going to cause smoking issues. And so if we exhaust above the water line, then it helps reduce the back pressure. Now these water lift mufflers can be made out of many different types of materials. Um, you can see them made out of fiberglass, plastics, stainless steel, steel. Um, and they come in different shapes and sizes. You mentioned just changing the coolant every two to three years. Is it because of aging or because of use? Well, it's from degrading. The, the liquid actually degrades. The chemicals separate out. Whether it's being used or not. Yes. And so, uh, and if you overheat and actually boil that antifreeze, it causes a separation, like immediately, almost immediately. A lot of us probably have added uh, larger alternators onto our engine like this. Mm -hmm. What I found is that that heavy load of the alternator, the, the, the belt that the wheel takes is a different shape than the rest of the pulleys on the front of the engine. Any comments on that? Yeah, it's the wrong pulley. It's <laughs> on the alternator? The alternator. The the well, the, the rest of the engine was correct from the factory. The, the add-on is the one that's incorrect. So the, the line that was fed to me was, well, but the heavier alternator, let's say it was a 40 amp alternator, the heavier alternator takes a heavier duty belt, so it's a different cross section. Well, yeah, the, I mean, but the, they don't match. They don't match. The, our, our engines are metric, so the pulleys on the engine are metric. And so when you go out and buy this Balmar, which is the right. typical brand that people buy, it's a U.S. company. And, and Balmar puts standard. standard SAE pulleys on the front of their. And so the angle of the V and the width of the V is different than metric. And so right there you have a mismatch and you're going to just tear through belts and you're now driving a higher amp alternator which requires more horsepower to turn it and that's going to cause the belts to, to go. So you should look into buying a serpentine kit and change the pulleys over to a serpentine system where it's a flat wide belt which can drive a much higher amp alternator and you get much less belt dust. <laughs> hey, I got an electrical question. Uh, we have a 2GM 20F and a Pearson 28 and we have a, you know, you turn the key, push the button. 90% of the time the engine starts. Usually uh, if we run out, turn the engine off and then to come back, I'll push the button and it'll click. I have done it the most I've ever done it is six times, and it's always started. Uh, I've read online other people's experience. They've changed the key, changed the solenoid, changed the push button, changed the boat. And it has your wire from the starter, from the key to the button. Well, there's a, there's a couple repairs for that. One is replace all your harnesses, which is going to run you 
twelve fourteen hundred dollars. Uh, another option is to run new wires from yeah. from the starter post up to the key and back down to the trigger post of the solenoid starter solenoid. Again, that's not factory. So when a technician comes, that you're going to mess with their uh, troubleshooting ability because now you're no longer factory. But the best and least expensive way is to put a relay, relay kit on the engine. So you can buy a Yamar relay kit, which is a socket and a relay with four wires coming off of the socket, and it takes about half an hour to install, and it runs about 60 bucks, 60 to 70 bucks for the socket and relay. <laughs> and the problem goes away for us. Correct. Why is that? And I don't want to get too many. Why is that better than the way it is now? Well, see, Yamar used the smallest size wire they could get away with, <laughs> and so after typically about ten years or so, the wire gets resistance built up into it, and so the longer the run, the more resistance is in the wire, and so if you actually start measuring voltage throughout that circuit, you're going to see you have voltage loss all the way up and then back down. So when you're hitting your, your start button, if you measure it on the trigger post, you might be seeing nine, nine and a half volts, which after the engine room is hot, you know, heat creates resistance also. So when you heat up those wires from them being in the compartment, you now it's going to be four or five tries to put enough voltage to create magnetism on a, that solenoid to cause a plunger to pull in properly. Where do you install the relay? Down at the starter. At the starter? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, it's four wires. Positive and negative, and then the one wire coming from your push button, and then the coming out is going to go to where the original wire from the push button was attached. Maybe once when you're done here, you can show me where you take your screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't use screwdrivers, we use a remote start button. Yes. For about $30, $35, you can buy a little push button with two alligator clips. Okay. Yeah. So you go from battery positive to the trigger post, and then you can operate it. It's called heart welding. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever want to remove that nut off the, the main starter post, you don't want to be melting the threads. <coughs> Is there a name for that? So, so I have a sale to start the sale, you have to be in the cockpit. Um, but to work on the engine, you have to remove the cockpit steps, and so it's impossible to start the engine down and the cockpit steps out. Um, so I'd love to get one, but is there a specific name for that $35 button that turns on? Remote start switch, remote start button. It's, in, it's just a, an automotive tool. Primary fuel infiltration. So, assuming you've got like a two micron factory secondary filter on the actual motor, you get into the brake pores, that you've got like a 10, 20, and 30 micron option. What do you typically recommend for that primary filtration? As far as the, the primary goes, most engine manufacturers recommend the 30 micron. Um, there are a handful that recommend the 10 micron. Never put a two micron as the primary. So if it doesn't recommend something, if, if, if that's not specifically spelled out in the manual, you probably go with a 30. You go with the 30. I mean, the, the engineers have decided whatever that OEM filter is, whatever that micron rating is, just buy that OEM filter. And it will be what the engineers wanted to filter down to protect the injection system. Okay. 
And the reason you want to go with a quarter, the micron is the size of the hole in the paper of the filter. The bigger the number, the bigger the hole. Um, so it, it's a coarse filtration. And the on engine filter is the fine filter. So it filters out the fine particulates. Um, now, again, we have this rubber diaphragm pump. If you try and make that diaphragm pull through a fine mesh filter, it has to work harder and it's going to stretch that diaphragm. <coughs> and so you use a coarse filter, which then lengthens the life of that diaphragm in that primary or in the fuel lift pump. You teach the advanced courses in here too? Yeah, we have the Annapolis school. That's up in Annapolis. The whole school is up in Annapolis. Yeah. But yes, I do teach both the, both the courses. In the mock I have a sensor uh, in uh, the mock mock and I can't figure out what the triggers. What's the question? Uh, in the mock uh, mm -hmm. I have a sensor. A sensor? And, alarm, and I have no idea what the triggers are allowed. Okay, that's for temperature. Yeah. So if, you, so if the exhaust temperature gets too hot, then it's going to give you a warning to let you know you stopped pumping water. Any numbers? No, that, that is a very oddball sensor. And I'm only, I think I've only seen it on two boats, honestly. <laughs> well, I haven't seen your place, so I guess there's a third out there. <laughs> so you talked about what happens if we run rich. What happens if we run a diesel lean? You're running lean. Um, typically, that will cause white smoke, is what you'll see, and you may see higher engine temperatures uh, when you run it lean. What causes the lean? Um, again, it could be something wrong in your fuel injection system. So your, either your uh, injection pump's not delivering enough uh, fuel pressure, or maybe your your injectors are the pressures or the needles sticking, so it requires more fuel pressure to, to deliver the fuel. Uh, colder cylinder temperatures. When the water heater is located above the engine, then you have to have another tank. So this pressure cap right here has to be the highest point in your cooling system. Yeah, yeah so, so this is supposed to be a really high pressure cap, and then the, the original pressure cap then goes in the top of the system. So all the pressure release is done at the highest point, not here. And this one here, the only time you open it is when you're doing a cooling surface, system surface. Where would you look for zincs on the engine to might be replaced, like the heat exchanger? Okay, any any cooler on the engine may have a zinc in it, or anode. It may not actually be a zinc, maybe aluminum, maybe magnesium. Um, so oil coolers, transmission coolers, uh, after coolers, fuel coolers, heat exchangers, they all could possibly have uh, zincs. If you have a sail drive, you may have a zinc on the inside boat on the sail drive and at the propeller. Can you talk about what a, what a runaway is? Uh, I've heard this term, you know, where you can't shut down and the, and the engine runs away. Yeah, so what a runaway is, is you basically lose control of your engine. So, so on an engine, we control the engine by controlling the fuel. So we want to speed up, we add more fuel. When we slow down, we take away fuel. When you, when you want to stop, you completely take away the fuel. And so when, you, when a runaway occurs, that's usually when you, there's a second fuel source. And usually that is when it runs on its own engine oil. So here, up the top of the engine, we've got our valve cover, 
And we've got this hose right here. This hose is called the crankcase breather. So you get pressure that, that gets compression that gets past the piston rings, once, especially the older your engine gets, the more uh, compression that's going to get by, past the rings and the cylinder walls. And that pressure is going to build up in the crankcase. And if you don't release that pressure, then it's going to blow out your seals and gaskets and you're going to have a lot of oil leaks. So there's always a crankcase uh, pressure vent. You know, back in the day, this hose used to just dangle off the side of the engine. And so any oil bankers would just shoot out the hose and then you get a drip of oil into the bilge and then it would get pumped overboard. And eventually somebody was like, hey, we, we, we can't have oil being pumped into the waterway. So now that hose is now redirected to the air intake. So now the oil is then goes through the combustion cycle, comes out the exhaust, goes up into the atmosphere, into rain clouds, into raindrops, <laughs> it still makes its way into our waterway, but we're not scrubbing any ducks, so uh, it's happening. That's, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but because we're now redirecting that crankcase pressure into the air intake, if you have a high oil level, so, so we have our oil level, and once, if that oil level gets too high and the crankshaft starts whipping into that high oil level, which we haven't talked about crankshafts, that's a component, that's going to create more oil vapor in the crankcase pressure. And now we're going to start pumping that extra oil vapor into the air intake. So what can cause some high oil levels? Well, we've got our fuel lift pump. Remember that rubber diaphragm? Remember we got this high, the, the low sulfur fuels causing problems? Well, one of the problems is it gets a pinhole in it. So every time it pumps, it pushes a little bit of diesel fuel through it, and that gets down into your oil. So not only are we getting a high oil level, now it's the oil is diluted with diesel fuel. So now we're not just whipping into a high oil, now it's high oil and fuel. So now we're not just pumping oil vapor in, we're pumping a fuel oil vapor into the air intake. And so then the engine starts running off of that fuel vapor and the RPM just go up to full throttle. You can pull back on that on the throttle to idle, but the RPMs are now staying up at full throttle because now it's running off your engine oil. At this point in time, you have to make a choice, fight or flight. So you may want to research what kind of uh, insurance you have, whether it covers uh, catastrophes to the engine or not, because um, that may help you decide <coughs> if the engine blows up, maybe, you get, maybe the insurance gets you another engine. Um, you know, so you either have to shut this engine down yourself, or it will shut itself off permanently. And so your choices are, so remember, we've got to think back to that fire triangle. We're normally controlling the fuel side of that triangle to take away the, the uh, combustion cycle. So we've lost control of the fuel, which now leaves two other sides of that triangle we need to take away, or one of the other two, to be able to get this engine to stop. So if you have one of these older engines that had the ability to be hand started with a hand crank, there's items on here called decompression levers, which these de decompression levers, what they do is they push open and hold open the exhaust valves so we can put a hand crank on the front of this engine, get it spinning by hand as fast as we can so we can close these and get the cylinders to fire and get it started. But we can also use that to shut down the runaway. Because now we can open all these up, we take the heat side of the triangle away, and the engine's gonna, gonna come to a stop. But this was, I think, the biggest horsepower engine I've seen these on was a three-cylinder turbocharged Volvo, which is about 39, 40 horsepower. There are no more engines made with these. So if you have a, a, a boat that's made after 2012, I think, there's no way you're ever even going to have one of these on, on your engine. Which leaves the air side of the triangle is the only option we have to take away. And so the, the best way would be to come over here and 
grab a book, <laughs> and then we're by the edge of the room, we're gonna put a book against the opening to the air, and we're gonna starve this engine of air. Now, if you have a bigger engine which has which has a you know big air filter, you're gonna probably want to preempt this, and so. What you can do is you can go to the hardware store and you can buy some contractor grade um, thick mill trash bags. And so you're, you're gonna you know, get that you know, 12 mil um, thick trash bags. You'll take two of them and you'll put one inside of the other, shake them out, and then you're gonna fold it up and put it to the side in the engine room. That way if it ever, you ever did get a runaway, you can then open up this double line, really thick plastic, and put it over the air filter, wrap it up, and hold it tight. And that will suck in, and hopefully it'll be enough to, at least, if it doesn't shut the engine down, it should drop the RPMs down enough to where when you hit your actual stop, it should shut down. So if you don't shut off down in that situation, like, you have Well, that, that's going to be your, your first try. I mean, if you're if you're at the helm and, and you're you're no, it, it it usually gives you a sign that it's getting ready to happen, and if you're not paying attention, you're so normally what happens is you're you're running along, and then you'll notice that the RPMs went up a couple hundred RPMs. You're like, hmm, that's odd, and you just bump it back to you know your 2500. A minute later. You know, pumps up another couple hundred RPMs. When you're thinking that vibration is causing your throttle, move, so you pull it back a little bit. And then the next time it doesn't just go a couple hundred R RPMs, then it goes, yeah. So if you're noticing that little change in the RPMs, then you can you know be aware and you know bring it down, maybe shut the engine off, and then check your oil, see if your oil level is high. Um, but you have to be aware of that, is a, that RPM change. That's, it'll be slight at first. So normally we change the oil, cleanse the motors on the water, we warm up the engine, drain the oil. Is there a recommended method for changing the oil when the motors on the heart, when you know, we can't start the engine? Um, I won't change oil on the on my own. I mean, you can run the engine off a garden hose, but you have to run the engine for a really long time to create to warm it up enough. So, so if someone's already on land, we'll tell them we gotta put the boat in the water. We'll service it. Touched on that on another question I had. If you are, there's nothing else you can do, and you need to start the engine. What do you crank in front? Open up the decompression lever. Yeah, well, this engine has a decompression lever, but it doesn't have the location to put the hand crank on it. Because it's actually only a, on the raw water cool version of this engine. Yeah, so, so this spot right here, the, there'd be a, a hole in the end of this cap. Which the tool would go into that hole, and you'd be rotating the actual camshaft. Yeah, when the freshwater cooled version has a circulation pump, so the belt goes over top of it. The raw water cooled version, it's only driving the alternator, so it has a spot to actually. Um, I'm better than 1989 uh, four cylinder universal on the sailboat. And uh, the way I normally shut it down is with the compressor, because I don't, if you just turn the, the key, it continues to run. Um, is that correct? No. Okay. Um, so depending on which one, some of them you just pull the throttle all, all the way back and that would shut them down. But you should have a stop pull cable. Yeah. It should be a, a little T-handle that you pull. Well, that's what I'm pulling. I was just assuming that was a compression release. No, that's a stop cable. That's a stop cable? Yeah. Yeah, typically the decompression release usually don't have a cable going to it. Decompression release is normally you have to manually do it at the engine. Are you trying to turn it off with the key? 
you're not trying to turn it off the key, are you? Well, no, I don't. I, I pull that. Yeah, yeah. So was I, I mean, I used to have a, a raw water pulled. My, my uh, old boat, I had a, um, a Yanmar 3GM, but the original raw water pulled version. And I believe that did have a compression release of that's the way we turned it off. So. That's your first try. I mean, it, it may, like I said, if it just happened, that may be enough to, to slow it down and, and get it. What you were doing was cutting off the supply of fuel. That yeah, that right there is the stop lever. And so what the stop lever does is on your injection pump, there's a fuel rack. And so there's a, an idle position, a full throttle position, and then if you go all the other way, then what happens is it doesn't deliver enough fuel pressure to the injectors. If you don't, injectors don't have enough fuel pressure, then they don't spray, there's no fuel in the cylinder, the engine comes to a stop.
through general, for young marks, like for this one, how many hours you can get out of it before they be able to get the mark? Because normally you use What was the question? <laughs> how many hours can you get out of a, an engine? Um, let me look at my crystal ball here. <laughs> um, most marine diesel engines don't live a natural life. They normally get murdered. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what kind of boating you're doing. I mean, if you're the, the average Chesapeake Bay sailboater, you're putting 20 to 50 hours a year on your engine. So, if that if that engine's seeing you know 1,500 hours in its 20 to 30 year lifespan, that's a lot of hours. But if this boat is going down to Florida and the Caribbean every year and back up to Maine and it's doing a lot of cruising, that boat's going to see eight to nine thousand hours without too much difficulty. So it just depends on how you use it. Diesel engines are designed to be ran. And they're designed not to be babied. Run hard. Run it hard. Don't baby it. If you baby it, it's not going to last as long. Uh, two questions. You're filming this. Is this going to be available on the HHN website? Um, this is being filmed by Harrington, so that's okay. a question for that. Whatever they do with it. And this idea about don't baby it, I, I, you know, I usually take my boat out, run it at a certain RPM, and I try not to push it. But other people told me now, nah, jam it down, do a wide open throttle every now and then, let it run. What's your thinking on that and this baby engine? Yeah, so most manufacturers want to see like an 80% load on that engine at, at, for your cruise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so whatever your max RPM, so this said is like 3,600 and forward. So 80% of 3,600, which is like, like 2,650 or so, is what you can cruise that engine all day long at. Um, but if your hull speed, if you hit your hull speed at 2,400, run it at 2,400, because that extra you know, 250 RPMs, all you're doing is causing a stern squat and you're just burning more fuel. If you're not actually, you may gain an extra tenth or so in speed, but, but you're just, now you're just overloading the engine. But at the end of the day, we do recommend running um, just before you get to the no wake zone, running, running at full throttle for you know, two or three minutes, four minutes. Um, it should be able to do it. You should be able to do it without running hot or overheating. Now, if your engine's 40 years old and you've never done that to your engine, <laughs> you, you, you may provoke a problem. Uh, uh, but if you've been, if your engine's on the newer side, within you know, 10 years old, it should be able to handle it without any worries. Well, people usually tell me, oh, you got to burn the carbon off. You're not going to exactly, that's exactly you're what you're doing. You're creating that extra heat, which is going to burn the carbon off of the, the valves and, and stuff. And it's also going to give you an indication of the condition of the bottom of the boat. You're running gear, so if you can't achieve your full throttle, that's letting you know that you, probably, you may have a you know sea moss and and a, a minor reef growing on the underside of your boat. <laughs> yeah, so you should stay within your temperature range. You shouldn't be overheating, and you should be able to achieve your RPMs. So you'll start noticing with bottom problems that you'll you may have 100 RPMs less, and then the next two weeks later it's another 100 RPMs, and then eventually it's going to be like five or six hundred RPMs. So the normal tag on the there's like a max RPM and a continuous RPM? Yeah, continuous is the cruise. So, so it's not 80% of that. That is the cruise is the RPM. That can be the cruise. <coughs> it might be high. The max is 36 and the cruise is like 34. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're going to want to see 80%. 80% of max? Of max, not 80% of the cruise. Why not just cruise? Well, cruise. well, most boats at 3,400 is way past your pulse speed.
do I have a major problem here? It's always been that way. You. So say that one more time. Yeah, when I go at high speed, full throttle, I reach 2800 RPM. But either when I push the RPM, it goes to 3200. Mm -hmm. Is that bad? That's normal. There's no load on the engine in, in neutral. So you're going to achieve a higher RPM, and then once you load it, it's, it's going to be several hundred RPM. Okay. Okay. No, I mean, I mean, always fine. I mean what, what you have to do is know what your full throttle is supposed to be in full, and then go from there. And that will tell you whether you're over or not. Um, I'm told that most of the attacks, I have several people like that, I'm told that most of the attacks are very bad. Um, can I do that? The tachometers the are really bad. Um, the, newer, the newer tacks have a circuit board in them. So they're pretty accurate to you know, 10 to 30 year old. Yeah, you know, well, the, the modern tacks have a circuit board in them, which, which can get the RPM is dialed into within 10 to 50 RPMs of accuracy. Yeah. But again, most most tachometers run off of the signal from the alternator. So if your belt's not tight, or if you, uh, the diameter of the pulley's been changed, it's spinning at a different speed. So all that can create inaccuracies in the actual true reading of what the engine is doing. But with the electronic one, I can put in a fudge factor. Well, you, they can, you can set them. So you can, there's a tool you can use to check the RPMs of the crankshaft with a handheld tool. Yeah. And, then, and then you can dial the tech in from the readings of the, of the handheld. Anyone else? But this broke, uh, and I when you say integrated exhaust or neutral, I'm not for sure the shuttle speed. So what's the... Depends on what kind of transmission you have. Yeah, so, so some of them will have a, a, a clutch cone, a cone clutch, and so when you lock it into gear, that cone gets like jammed, really jammed in there when you're sailing with it locked in here. So trying to get it back to neutral a lot of times can be really difficult. If you have a hydraulic transmission, you don't want the propeller freewheeling because it uses oil pressure from the pump inside the transmission to lubricate everything. And so if that engine's not running, then the pump's not running so nothing's being lubricated but you're spinning that output shaft which will damage the, the bearings and stuff in that transmission. There's no clear answer to it um, and then there's the argument of and for sailors as to which way is faster you know it's a lock, lock propeller or a spinning propeller which I'm not getting in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I believe they wanted a neutral on sail drives now. And so if you don't want your prop spinning, you're going to have to spend the money on a feathering or folding prop. Uh, back to the savings for just a second. Uh, are there marked stamped in the cast iron or are they a different shape? Is there, is there a way to readily tell that's a zinc and not just a regular bolt holding something on? Um, is it, I, I have a bolt bolt, but well, a lot of times when the edge is new, the plug that the zinc goes on may have had a sticker that said zinc on it. Um, yeah, so you have to just look into your manual because a lot of engines may not even have zincs in their, in their uh, heat exchanger. So you can look in the manual for this engine and it says there's zincs. But the one manual covers 
freshwater pool edges and the raw water pool edges. The raw water pool edges have zincs. The freshwater pool models do not. That was like, I don't know how many, every boat show from the late 80s to early 2000s. Because I had worked for a Yamar dealer at least 20, 20 times a day. Where are my zincs? Show me my zincs. What did you have? You don't have them. But my manual. Well, they didn't specify in the manual that it was for the raw water pool. Thank you. 
Yeah, you hook it. You hook it right here, and you're going to be cranking it from here. I mean, you're going to be, you're, the whole point is to be able to, to jump it down here, not to have a second way of cranking from your, your helm. Okay. I'm thinking of something else. Something on the Can you talk about the relay kit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the relay kit still gets installed down here, and it just gets left in place. 